everyone. Welcome back to Sharon Cullen Art. The other day I did a plein air painting that I was going to show on video. And it was of a landscape in my front yard. And I worked in gouache. But I started editing the video and through half of the video my hair was covering the lens. Because I leaned forward and the lens was so close to my head, I ruined the video. That's kind of what happens when you're doing YouTube videos. So sometimes they don't come out. So I wanted to show you the painting that I did. It was this painting here. These are just some leaves that I glued down, kind of like a journal entry. Um, but this was the actual painting that I did. And I posted it on Instagram. But I can't really use that video. So today I'm going to redo this, this painting or a similar painting, uh, and add some more shadowing. I'm going to change it up a bit. I'll do it on a, a block rather than in a sketchbook. And I'm wondering if I should just do uh, watercolor. I know some of you prefer watercolor. Some of you come here for gouache. Some of you come for both. So I'm trying to keep everyone happy. I was thinking of doing my painting in this, but I think I want to save this for plein air painting. This is a book that I have not even tried yet. I mean, a block. And it is by Paul Rubens. I got it on Amazon, and I just happened to run across it. It is watercolor paper, 100% cotton. Um, it says hot pressed, which is not something I normally like, but I could not get it in cold press. But this paper is in a block, and it's very, very nice. So I think I'm going to save this for plein air painting. Um, I, like I said, I don't prefer hot press paper, although with gouache it makes no difference because gouache is not really a flowing kind of paint. But I find that with hot press paper I don't get as good a flow. It's very short flowing. That's a lot of reason that... People who do botanical paintings like it. They like the smoothness because flower petals are smooth, leaves are smooth, um, and they don't want that rough texture. But it also is easier to control the paint uh, and where it goes to because hot press paper doesn't flow like cold press does. Uh, but So I think I'm going to use my Arches um, Rough, actually, paper. This is... Um, 300 GSM, 140 pound, and it is 10 by 14. So I'm just going to go ahead and start with my drawing first, and I'm going to whip that down real fast just to get some lines on the paper, and then we will go from there. Now, I was looking at my photos here, and I'm thinking I probably will go with this photo because I want to get some of the shadowing in here. Uh, I like the close-up tree on this side. I like the bunch of brush. And then I still have that tree that came down over here. I had it over on the right hand of my frame before. But this looks good from this angle. And this is, uh, that's a different photo. This was another one that I was thinking of doing. This shows the brush close-up and a different tree being down. The other one is way over here and goes off the frame, although I could add it back into the frame. There is a pine tree in the background, which I think I will add just to get some green back in the photo. And then this is more of what I did on my sketchbook the other day, was this frame right here. If I were to um, zoom it in here, I did it from about here to here. That was That was the actual picture and there's the brush, and then this way over to the left. So that's what I did, only I brought it in a little bit closer. So I'm going to skip this, and I'm going to do something a little bit different. I think we'll go with uh, something like, I like this picture here. I think we'll go with that one. Once I have the drawing down, uh, and I apologize for shadows, my expensive photography light is broken, probably from all the banging around and not having a studio right now, but that's neither here nor there. So um, when I have my, my 
initial drawing down, then I make decisions. You, the biggest thing with watercolor, people say, oh, it's so hard, it's so unforgiving, but really, as long it just requires some proper planning ahead of time so that you know exactly what your plan is. You can do that by looking, if you're painting from life or your photography that you've, your photo that you're using, um, like here on this foreground, I don't have all of this foreground, but I do have a portion of it, probably up to about here. So I want to look at that and make sure I remember that there are white areas here. Now you can do that either by drawing some small pencil lines that you'll go around or by using masking fluid or just by dry brushing and not worrying about the exact placement. This log here appears to be a birch log. So, or maybe it isn't. No, I can't tell. It's just something without bark on top. So that area is going to stay fairly white. And then when I look at my leaves, I look at how light the leaves are in certain areas. When you're painting in watercolor, you paint from light to dark. I think most of you all already know that. And I also will put in my sky holes ahead of time. Now, some of them may get covered up a little bit, and that's fine. But I just want to make sure I have some in there so that I have some sky or some light sky remaining because we want that contrast from the darkest darks to the lightest lights. Now, this is a great spot here because we have this dark green on this tree in brown, it looks like, and a little yellow. But... Um, against these very light pale blue skies. So, and the same goes with the shadows, light against dark, light against dark. Y you want to make sure that you have some lights against your darks because that contrast is what's going to really make your painting pop. So before you set that brush down on your paper, just do your proper planning beforehand. Use your masking fluid if you plan to use it drawing your lines that you're going to need in order to remember what you're going to be doing, and then just start your painting. I usually like to start with my sky, but starting with your sky is not always uh, where people like to start. Some people like to start at the bottom and work up. You, you can make your own choices, but you always do have to start with your lights and work towards your darks so that you don't end up having to try to put a light over a dark later. I wanted to show you guys something. I had to take a break for a while because they came to start putting the brick down for my art studio. There's a bunch of cinder block in this trailer and he got the trailer stuck in the mud. He was stuck so deep. His, his truck was stuck like way out over here and the ruts over there, you can't really tell, but they are, some of them are like over a foot deep. And he's sinking. So that's kind of a drag. I was hoping the excavator would have come and filled that in for me before he left for Florida, but he didn't. So now we got that to deal with. And he says they're going to have to carry them by hand by wheelbarrow, which is not his first plan. But that's where we're at for the art studio. They did say that my... Um, my uh, trusses, my roofing, and all of my siding has come in. So that's where we're at with that. And I'm going to go ahead and get started on the painting. And I'll keep you posted with my, with my blogs or vlogs, whatever. Okay, now... To start, I'm going to just go ahead and mix up a little bit of blue. I think I'll use a little bit of, uh, this is cerulean. I'm not normally a cerulean person because I like transparent colors. Cerulean is more opaque than most, but this sky calls for a cerulean sky, so that's why I'm going to go ahead and do it. And I'm just going to dry brush it in and pretend there's clouds too so that we can have some... Uh, contrast here. Just doing it very pale and that way I'm 
can do its own thing. Whoops, was that a tree? That is a tree. Oops, I messed that up, but that's okay. I'm just going to put this between here. Oh, now that dog's trying to come in. I just let him out. Oh, he's obnoxious sometimes. And a little bit down here, down low. My brush isn't quite wet enough, but... There. Now, some of that blue will get covered by, by um, leaves, and that's fine. I just want to have the options for these sky holes. Okay. Now, you might be worried because some of the, the colors are going to be yellow, but this is such a pale color here, I think we'll be fine. My yellows are a bit dirty, so I'm just going to wipe them off. A little bit and get rid of the greens and blues that are on the edges. Just set it on my rag here. There. Now I'm okay. All right. Now my next colors that I want to lay down are going to be some of the lighter yellows. So I'm going to take this. I want to get rid of this blue on here. We're done with blue. I'm going to take this light yellow and I'm going to really water it down. And I just want to place some yellow in here all over covering up the areas of white that need to be covered these colors will get darker in time there's a ton of yellow in this painting so And I'm going right to the edge of my block. Uh, I kind of like doing that when I'm going to be making a framed painting because that way I know that I don't have to worry about any edges showing later. You know what I mean? And there's a lot here that is going to be covered with leaves. So what I'm going to do is make these tree trunks disappear so they don't stay there when I'm putting leaves in. I want them to be shorter. Uh, this one has a little space here and there. There, that's probably good. Okay, back to my yellow. Put that in there. That goes in front of the tree trunk. And that's another thing when you're painting trees. Some people say, how do you paint so many trees in a forest? This used to intimidate me quite a lot. I mean, really a lot. But um, I just realized that all I got to do is paint tree trunks in later if that's what I want, you know. It's not a big deal. And if you put in your lightest colors of your background first, then uh, painting the rest of the leaves later over that color make it very simple. There's a lot of low yellow. There's green so what I can do is I can make all of this yellow down to the ground. The ground is going to have more browns, more burnt sienna, stuff like that. But what I'm going to do here is take these to the ground, or almost to the ground, and then I can worry about what color those leaves are later. They're all different shades of yellows and greens, so the yellow is pretty neutral as far as that goes. can use deeper yellows. I can use reds, I can use blues to make the green, so we're okay there. And I put yellow on here, I probably shouldn't have. I keep getting that tree trunk confused, so I've got to make sure I've got that set. Okay. 
Let's see if this even comes out. It may not come out. <laughs> it's been so long since I painted with watercolor, you know? Crazy. And there was a lot more green over here. So on this corner, I'm just going to put that yellow in there all the way down. It's a lot less blue sky showing through there. And there's a lot of green down at the base here. There must be pine trees. I'm going to have to blow this up to see. But in the meantime, I'm just going to put the yellow in so that I have the yellow leaves taken care of. And you don't need to put in every individual leaf. That's the other thing. People get overwhelmed by that. But you really don't have to worry about all that. Okay, now I want to start looking at where my ground is. My ground comes up fairly high here. So what I'm going to do is take a little bit of, is that raw sienna? That might be yellow ochre. I think that's yellow ochre. Nope, it's raw sienna. Okay, I'm going to take some raw sienna. That's a nice color to put down over here. And I want to get this in the higher Colors. Now, raw sienna comes in a lot of different varieties. And as far as my, also my dry brushing goes, remember I'm using rough paper. And rough paper allows for more of that dry brushing effect. Okay. This comes way up behind here, too. You can see in my photo. I'm coming up here with the brown. I'm going to come across, come down here. The raw sienna, I mean. Oops, that's my brush, which is fine. I can cover that. Just got to remember that's there. This comes up here. The brush I'm using today is by Princeton. It's an Aqua Elite. This is a really nice synthetic brush if you like synthetic brushes, but it's already wearing out. I've used it for a few months and it's already wearing out. So that's kind of a drag, but that's the way synthetics are people think they're saving money and you end up spending a ton more money I've got animal hair brushes that are quite um, old years old and I still use them a lot of my squirrel brushes my sables I've heard some People, some people have gotten somewhat angry with me for using animal hair brushes, and to each their own. You know, you can make an argument for both sides. Yeah, animals do die. They're lab-raised, and they do die, and it's sad. I don't like that. I li I'm an animal lover. I love it. I also eat meat, and there's horrible slaughtering that goes on with meat. Um, I try not to think about it. Sometimes I can't eat meat because I do think about it, but... Um, the other thing with synthetic brushes is that it requires petroleum, but the petroleum based products are huge. And when you think about the environment for our loved ones, our next generation, we're doing them a disservice by using petroleum based products. And that's what these are made of. So it can go either way. You just got to figure out what's best for you and go with it and don't judge others for what their choice is. Every step we make in life has consequences, you know? So now I'm gonna kinda dry brush some of this in over here. I just dabbed my brush off to dry it a little bit, but I wanna keep some of the whites of the paper. So I'm just bringing this in like this. And I can always, I can always add more color later. 
but I want to get that brush dry. So what I've done was I wet my brush, kind of dried it. I grab a little bit of that burnt or that raw sienna, and then I dry off my brush. This is a little more concentrated, but then I just take it and I run it here and there. And that's how you dry brush. There's greens up here that I'm going to go to next, and they're kind of a light green, but what I'm going to start with is, um, I think, some of my rich green gold. I'm using Daniel Smith products. Uh, most of you already know me and know that, but if you're new to my channel, I do use mostly Daniel Smith products. It's what I like. It's what I'm used to. I'm not against other paints at all. So go with what you're used to. Some people prefer Holbein. Some prefer M. Graham. Some prefer uh, Winsor & Newton. And I'm a fan of some. Not a fan of others. And that's just the way it is for me. But that's okay. Now I'm going with a little bit. Uh, I'm going with an olive green here. And adding that in. I'm not worried about shadows at this point. I'm going to put my shadows in last. And I will add color right over that paint. Um, and then that olive comes way over here too. So I want to kind of put that olive in here. I love rough paper for landscapes. I find it works so great for texturing effects. So... And I like arches paper. But if you're not used to arches, it can be a challenge. So it's very dry at first, you might find. Okay, now I'm going to go with some sap. And I'm just going to touch it in here and there back in the background up here. So next week, I'm hopeful that my framing will go up on my art studio. Oh my gosh. The framing is all coming in. My trusses are coming in on November 5th, which is my kids' birthdays. They will be 34 years old on the 5th. And then my birthday is the 9th. They were the best birthday present I ever got. And I was the best birthday present my mom ever got because I was born four, five days, four days, four days before her birthday. My kids were born four days before mine, and I came four days before my mom. We were all born on Tuesdays, and we were all born in the morning. <laughs> Isn't that wild? Okay, now over on the left-hand side, there's the green from this fallen tree. There's uh, leaves on that tree. They're a little deeper green. So I'm going to go with a little bit of perylene green. If you just have sap or if you're mixing greens, just deepen the blue in your color. And I'm just going to kind of dry brush my leaves in here. Like that. This goes over the top. There. Okay, now I want to start working on the tree trunks because this part is pretty dry. So I'm going to take my, um, I'm going to grab a Kleenex here so I can wipe off my palette. Okay, right now I'm just grabbing some of my Hematite Genuine and I'm mixing it on my palette. I love Hematite Genuine for its granulating properties. It's a great, it's one of my favorite of the Primatec colors. It's really nice. And um, we do have some white on some of these trees, on most of them, actually. There's white along the edges. So I'm going to just start on the right-hand side because I am left-handed and I'm going to be working across. Um, I don't want to work across my work, so... This might still be a little too wet. I'm going to have to... Now I can come back with a smaller brush 
I will anyway because I'm going to darken the, the one side of the tree branches and I can take care of whatever white that's left I don't want to show. This tree goes in front of that tree. Just look at your trunks and you can remember what goes in front of what. This brush tends to hold a lot of paint, but I am using a size 12, which is a larger brush. It has a nice fine point. This is pretty dark underneath. It gets white on top. There's a beige that goes with that. So I'm going to grab some of that raw sienna again. Just give myself a little hair on my palette. And I'm going to go like this. I want these colors to mix together. Oh, shoot. I messed that up, but that's okay. I'm going to just change that there. I could... Um, try and pick it up with the wet brush. We'll see what I can do because this is a granulating color. It should lift real easily. I did lift some. There. Now I don't want to paint over that until it dries because it's going to bleed into that if otherwise. So I'm going to mix my Hematite Genuine and I'm also going to mix some other colors. I could use my, my blacks, but I think what I'm going to do is grab some burnt sienna. And I'm going to grab some blue, maybe some endanthrone blue. And I'm going to mix all these colors to add interest to the tree trunk. Okay. And some endanthrone. Or actually, maybe some indigo would be better. It's a little bit black or blue. It's got a little bit of black in it. So I'm just going to mix those two together. So what I'm going to do here is add blue. And then I'm going to go in with my hematite over that. Taking that right off the page. Leaving a little bit of white on the edges. Taking a little bit of my burnt sienna. Plopping that in here and there. This is going to make it granulate even more. And it'll give it some really gorgeous color. Some more of that blue... I'll zoom in here in a second, and you can see it granulate. Um, it's amazing how much these colors love to mix together, and they granulate so well. It's so pretty. And if you get a little sloppy with your tree trunks, just add a branch wherever you go off, you know, off your edge that you didn't want to. I'm just dabbing in what was left of the blue here. And I'm going to grab my burnt sienna and add that in here and there. There. Now let me zoom in and I'll show you how much it's granulating. I don't know if you can see that effect, but it looks like tree bark, the way it's granulating here. See it? It might be too shiny right now but as it dries it's just going to get darker and more granulated which is really a nice effect for tree trunks okay with your granulating colors let them dry completely before you go back in to do anything else to them you can see in this tree right here how much this granulated, where is it? This one, that right here, and right next to it there. Look at how, how well those are granulating. 
See if I can get in even closer here. That's what that hematite genuine does. It looks just like tree bark, doesn't it? And that's why I use Daniel Smith colors. I love the granulation effects. There is no other paint that I've ever tried that comes even close to the granulating properties of Daniel Smith. If you're one that likes clear, transparent, no granulation, well, they do have a lot of just transparent colors as well, which is nice. This um, Princeton Velvet Touch. I just bought this to try. Um, grabbing some more Hematite Genuine. I'm just gonna come back here and darken these areas up. is start to work on the leaves. I'm going to stick with this Princeton Velvet Touch. It's a number two, and I can define my leaves very clearly with a small brush. So um, I'm going to start out with, on the right-hand side again, and I've got a tree with a lot of kind of olive greens in it. So I'm just getting some water on this area. I'm going to start with olive green and then I can always go darker. Now, as you can see, I'm not putting in the leaves individually, at least not at this point. I will add some individual leaves, but I wanna just get the main underlying color down, which is this olive green. And then after, at the end, then I go back and I add all of my branches in. This is coming in from another tree branch off of the page. I just realized it's not part of this tree down below. That tree is yellow. So I'm just gonna put these spots in here. going to get my sap green which is a little bit brighter deeper value and I'm just going to drop it into the wet paint here and there and let these two do do their work mixing together then I also have to add a little bit more over here of that olive there we go and then back in again with the green, sap green, I mean. There we go. Now that part is getting, they're mixing, but what I wanna do now is take some Indanthrone Blue and just get it on the heaviest points. I'm just dabbing it in here and there. And then I'm just gonna let it kinda of do its work. looking at the picture to decipher which areas are dark and which ones aren't. Right here I've got darkened areas and then they get lighter. So I'm just going through all that and kind of looking at what I have here. This area in here is very orange. It's got a lot of deep yellows in it as well. I'm gonna use some of my deep yellow and also, I want to get some of my Aussie Red Gold. That's a lovely color for, for fall foliage. Just let that work on my palette. Or in the well, I mean. Just adding some of my water to them. Now, I'm going to go back in over here. Add this in. You know, I do a lot of this in hyperlapse, and this can get very boring and tedious, so I'll fast forward through some of it and pop back in. But just so you know, I'm just working with the end of the brush. I don't choke up on it like this. 
um, usually because I can't get the playful movement of the brush that way. So what I do is I back off to the end of the brush and I just kind of let it do its thing. I wiggle it around and that kind of makes it look like leaves. Now again, these aren't the defined leaves and I want to leave some of that lighter yellow in there where the light is touching so that it gets that light and dark look. And I'm going to go ahead now with the Aussie Red Gold and I'm going to add that here and there. Oops. I want some of that deep yellow up here too though. Some of the blue areas that are covered with yellow, I'm going to cover up with a deeper yellow so that you don't see the blue sky as much through that yellow. This is very thick foliage in here and the temptation even though it looks to be dark, there are light areas, so I want to leave some of these light areas showing through of that light yellow that we laid down in the beginning. There's really no sky showing way down here, so I'm going to cover that up. Remember to refer back to your photo so that you don't get overboard with your color, a certain color that you might like. Like, I love this deep color, but it doesn't come way over here, so I've got to make sure I keep it in this area. And then there is yellow, and then there's there's um, green mixed into that. I'm going to grab some of this kind of olive color and add that into certain spots. I think that's the key when doing fall foliage is don't don't separate your colors so much that you can't that it looks you it looks too perfect I guess is the word I'm looking for. I like the way these colors all kind of blended together here. Now there's some orange that comes down here and there's light on it as well. So I want to keep some of that light yellow in there, too. Now I'm going to be adding in that brush pile right there. I start with a lighter color, then go over it with a deeper color, and I'm letting it dry. I need to come back later, add some more brush to the top, darken, the, deepen the values underneath, and then I need to add a lighter. I'll be coming back with a light pencil at the end. And here I want to go ahead and put the branch in that's coming in off the edge of the page so that I don't forget and try to add it in as a tree there. Now I'm switching back to my larger brush just to get some of that yellow down on the left hand side and then I want to start putting in my underbrush on the forest floor, it's deepening that raw sienna and burnt sienna color. And right now I'm using burnt sienna to go back in I've switched back over to my Velvet Touch brush, the long round number two, and I'm defining some of the leaves on that fallen tree. Now 
Now there's areas that have leaves that are coming across this tree. So I went in with my scrub brush and I just scrubbed out a little bit of the tree trunk, which was very simple to do because they were, they were colors that sit more on top of the paper and it was easy to lift them. Um, be careful though if you're scrubbing with a brush on non-cotton paper because you will tear up your paper very easily. So you have to be very careful. And the brush I use is just a very short hog, uh, faux hog bristle brush. It was like a master's touch or something like that from Hobby Lobby, I think. I've had it for about 10 years. Now I'm beginning to define that brush pile by going back in with a little deeper brown and just adding in the branches so that they look a little more defined, I'm letting it dry, and then I'm gonna go back again and do it a little bit more. past year and I got just a little bit more done over here um, later in the day but I, get, I stopped because I didn't want to mess up the painting and uh, I thought we were on a roll so just pulled it up here and I'm grabbing my brush and now I'm gonna work over here the one thing I don't like is that these spots look too evenly spaced they're somewhat evenly spaced in the photo but I'm gonna go ahead and scrub out a little bit more so that we can, um, there's a little bit underneath here where leaves come in. And I'm just taking off, this granulating color does not stain as much, um, although the, the blue does, I believe. So it's low staining, but it's staining. And I'm gonna make this spot up here a little bit bigger so that we can add more leaves here because part of that will be covered. If it gets framed, it, the matting will cover like right here and we're not gonna be able to see any of those leaves. So I'm gonna bring it down further, down into here. And that should help keep the, um, the evenness out. I'm just gonna make that one a little taller so that it doesn't look so even. Okay, now I'm gonna grab my lemon yellow and I'm just gonna go in here and add some yellow in. Now that can be darker because the sunlight is behind the trees, so it's not gonna hit the, the leaves that are hidden right by the tree trunk. They'll be in shadow a little more. So we don't have to worry about that. Now. I'm gonna go back with my number two long round by uh, Princeton Velvet Touch. Okay. I added a little bit of red in over here too, instead of just having it in that one spot. Some of the leaves here were a deep, deep orange, almost a red. I ended up using some crimson uh, I put a little crimson back over here because the scarlet that I was using, it was uh, in fact, what is that? In fact, no, I scarlet, I always say it wrong. It was in fact, renown. Nope, in fact, renoid scarlet, I was right the first time. So, um, I was kind of mixing it up a bit. And again, using the end of the brush so that you can just kind of tickle it on, dancing around a little bit. That helps to um, give it a more natural look. Oops, that one is orange. I don't want the orange. Oh, I might try the orange. Let's just see what it looks like. Yeah, it's a little orange, but it is pretty. You can also, if you don't, you have um, the Aussie Red Gold, Quinacrinone Sienna is very, very similar in color. Let me, let me show you here. When I bought them, I wasn't sure what I wanted. 
That's the back. We'll use the back. This is anthacrinoid, I mean, quinacridone sienna. And then this one is the Aussie Red Gold. They're very close in color. I think the Aussie might be a little bit lighter, but they're very similar. Yeah, it's got a little more yellow to it, but they're so close. And then there's um, Quinacridone Gold. See how close these colors are. They're all very close in color. Now, I don't know how my camera's picking that up, but that's Quinacridone Sienna. That is um, Aussie Red Gold and then Quinacridone Gold. This is the old formula, Quinacridone Gold, which is a single pigment color, and they don't make it anymore. They have a new formula because they ran out of Quinacridone Gold. Um, this was PO49, but that no longer exists in the world. It's been used up. It's too bad that you can't make more, but when it's used up, it's used up, you know? So, so I'm just going to go back in here and finish up these leaves a little more. Remember to try to keep some light areas. I have a lot of light that comes through here. It gets more dense here, more dense down here, and then my light comes across the grass, and I still have to do my grasses in my um, lower area. So I'm going to take some uh, burnt sienna, and I'm just going to kind of dab this on here and there. This can be dying plants, ferns. It can be leaves on the ground. Um, there's a lot of debris on the forest floor. So I'm just putting it in here. Same way, dancing it in. Boy, our weather today for Halloween is horrible. I know it, it's horrible all over the Midwest and Northeast, but um, we're supposed to get snow later today which is kind of a drag. I don't know if we will here by the lake. In the fall, the lake keeps us warmer than inland areas, like where I used to live was further in from, from the lakes. I was close to Lake St. Clair, which is where uh, Lake Huron drains into Lake St. Clair on the south end, and then goes into the Detroit River, which then goes into Lake Erie. So, um, I was inland from that by probably 20 miles from the water, from the big water. And so we stayed very cold and I was also in a snow belt and we got a lot of snow where I was. But here in the fall, the lake is a little bit warmer. So it keeps us from getting too cold too fast. But once that lake freezes, it's all over for us. Um, we end up getting tons of snow and then the winter is very long and then in spring our spring comes later because then the lake is cold and it keeps our temperatures colder than the inland areas so kind of strange how that works but that's how it works so today the only thing I have planned is to go to the dentist now on these other areas that are real pale, I'm going to start by taking just my a little bit of my burnt sienna on my brush really diluted because I want to keep that light so it looks like it's reflected. I'm just taking like a brown, I think it's an oxide, let's see, that one is transparent oxide brown. Um, and I like that color. I don't know if that one is, that one might be like a Rembrandt or something, but it might be Daniel Smith. I'm not sure. I may have run out of the one that I had by Rembrandt and I loved it. So I bought one from Daniel Smith. Some of those European colors are a lot more expensive because you're paying the import fees and all of that. And that kind of is a drag. So make sure you stay away from your light areas when you're going in with the dark paint again. I'm heading back up the, up the hill here a little bit, or down the valley or up the valley, whatever. And this area of the tree is not as sunny, so I'm going to just kind of do that in like that. 
and then let it get brighter on the edge. Now putting in branches, I usually take a darker color because the branches appear very dark in photos. Well, they appear dark in real life too. Um, but a lot of these, actually this branch, I'm gonna start way back here and pick it up again because this branch is, this is all part of that tree. And I usually, some people are good at going backwards and starting backwards and then making their branches thicker. I usually like to start thicker and then flick them off at the end. Um, but I want to pick up those leaves. Now make sure you don't take your entire branch through the whole thing because you've got leaves that run over the top and run underneath and so on. So... Um, that way you can just pick them up, drop it, pick it up, drop it, that kind of thing. When you get to the end of the leaves, you can always make your branches start to um, taper, you know, stick out. When you hit the sky holes, that's where you're, you should absolutely have your branches showing there. And just have fun with it. Don't take them all off of the sides like this. And then have go this way and then that way and this way. Um, make sure you pull some off of the front. Maybe have some coming out from the back where they're just poking out like that from the back. Uh, you'll want, want to do all of that so that it looks more realistic. I need to make this wider here, this trunk. There we go. That's a little better. Um, what else can I tell you? I think that's pretty much it. So I just put all these branches in. Again, I don't choke way up. I suppose you could, but if you need to, to have that control, you can do that. Um, but I like to go down to the end of the brush again. I'm just using a little indigo blue and hematite genuine mixed together. Uh, sometimes I pick up some neutral gray, it just depends. That branch got big. I'm just gonna fit it into the tree there. And you know, you don't have to look at your picture and make them all exact. Some of the big branches you might if that's what attracted you to the tree to begin with. And then I like to pull my brush in from the side. That gives more gran granulating look and more texture of the tree bark. I'll show you close up what I did. Um, oh, am I in hyperlapse? Yeah, no, I'm not on hyperlapse. <laughs> I thought I was. Okay, let me back this out a little bit. You can see right right here on this tree how I added that texture there to get that look of darkness on the one side and having it lighter on the other because then I've got light down here coming in so 
That's why I do that. When I get close to these leaves, that covers up the light, so I'm going to darken this area of the tree trunk to make it look a little more realistic. This one over here needs to be darker. And I got a sky hole here, so I can't have my branch just stop unless it's broken off. I'm just going to continue it through the sky hole and have it go through there. There we go. And then this needs to come up here too. There. That looks a little better. This should be darker here. This should be darker on this side and always in this little spot here if the light's coming at this angle. I may add a little bit use a little bit of white gouache in my painting too. Now, I'm not a purist like some people are. I don't think it's a big deal. Um, I don't do judge, judge jury shows and stuff like that. So um, if you do, then you have to use all of one, like you got to do all watercolor or whatever. You can't mix the two mediums together. They don't allow mixed media, I don't think. Maybe they've changed those rules, but I'm going to fix these over here. Sometimes I feel like the tree trunks get a little bit too light. So going back in later. Whoops, I just slipped. So I'm going to add a branch there. Very simple. Make those darker. Oh, my washers <laughs> out of balance. Sorry, guys. I'm running some laundry right now. Now, there's a lot of broken off branches on my trees down low, so I'm going to add them in. Now, I'm going to begin on the shadows down below. And I'm just using some moon glow. I also have shadow violet in my palette. I went with the Moon Glow because it is a warmer color and since it's a warm painting I thought I would stick with warm values. Uh, but if you're mixing your own you can mix a little bit of uh, whatever uh, lizard and crimson and some uh, ultramarine blue or or you can use a little bit of Payne's Gray. It's hard to just darken what the color of whatever you're painting with in this regard because you're going over burnt sienna then you're going over greens and and you're going to be mixing a lot of colors so going with a color that is more of a shadow like color it's just uniform all the way through like the way that ended although it's not going to show under the matting let's see now this, these shadows go all over the place even through the the light areas there's some dark shadowing it's kind of dappled light Over by that log, it gets a little bit darker here.
I'm just adding shadows in for debris and trees that would be back further. It doesn't hurt to add that in. Okay. I'm going to let that dry and see how I like it. In the meantime, I'll, oops, I'll go ahead and finish my leaves up here where things are just kind of foggy and just set in there. I'm going to start adding some more definition. And then there was an area of the tree that got real defined. Oh, maybe that was a different photo. I guess it was. But these branches were a little more defined, uh, the leaves. So I'll just make sure that I put some more definition on those. And I'm not really doing maple leaves. I'm just giving some of the leaves points. So it looks gives the appearance of a maple leaf with points on it. My deeper yellow and just kind of bring that branch out. And then bring it down again. And it should go across this tree because that tree is behind it. So I'm just going to kind of erase a little bit of this and make it a little easier for the leaves to go across. I just used a fake hog hair bristle brush. This was a master's touch. I got it when I first started painting in watercolor. It's my favorite little scrubber brush, but you got to be gentle because you can go right through your paper. And if you're using non-cotton paper, be very, very careful with your scrubbing because the scrubbing will um, definitely tear your paper and you don't want that. So just, just be aware. I used to use Strathmore paper when I first started to paint. Um, I always felt like I couldn't waste money on crappy paintings with good paper. So, so I always bought cheap paper, which was kind of silly. But because you'll find if you splurge and get yourself some cotton paper, you'll probably improve on your painting skills a lot quicker. And I wasn't aware of that. Now I'm going to let it dry. I do like this light spot in here. I think that's really pretty, the light shining through. And I've got to let this dry, and then i got to work on the ground a little bit more, I think. Now, knowing when a painting is done, for me, what I like to do is I like to snap a photo of my painting and stare at it through a photo because then I recognize all the errors and mistakes and things that need touch-ups and whatever. So right here is one of my problems. This should be leaning up against this tree. Otherwise it'll look like it's standing up by itself and it shouldn't be doing that. So I'm just going to have it leaning up against that tree there. Adding another branch on because there's lots of branches on this tree trunk. There we go. This can actually go over those. It was wet though, so there we go. And another thing I noticed was some of these tree trunks are way, way too light on the sides. I don't want that much light showing, so I'm going to take this dark color back over the Sematite Genuine and close in on this white a little bit so that there's just... A hairline of white showing on these trees that's what I want in some areas nothing at all so this one just has it here now the rest of this is basically um, that should be leaves coming up against it so I'm going to take some of my green and come right up against this here really close and then up here the yellow 
I'm going to take some yellow and bring that in a little bit. There. And the rest can be sky holes. And then I'm going to go back again with my hematite genuine and fix up this tree here. And bring the white down to just a sliver. I think that's getting better now. There's a lot of white though showing on that side as well. So I'm going to take my yellow right up to the edge here. There. Now if you get done with your painting and you find that you lost a lot of your whites, which isn't uncommon, especially when you're first starting out, you can take a pencil. Now this one is a Color Soft by Derwent. It's a white gray, and I'm just going to try it here. You can take a colored pencil and go down the edges of your tree trunks to bring some of that light back in to your trees. Um, be careful with white. It could be too stark a color difference. This one has some, it's a light gray, and the gray brings in some of the tree trunk color, I think. Uh, here, looks like I lose some, but with the rough paper, I get some texturing effects too, which is kind of nice. You can just bring that in here and there. That's all you got to do. And that helps to bring some light back into the into your painting. Or you can use gouache, or you can do nothing at all. But light effects are really helpful. So if you do lose your whites, there's no singular rule that says you have to be a purist and that you have to have only watercolor. I was taught that way, and when I first started out, I had it stuck in my head that I had to be that way. But my teacher was one who won many awards and shows and was a purist because of that, because that's what she did. She entered into shows and and would win. So um, she had to be a purist for that reason. I need a little more light on this. Now I have shadow coming across here, so I'm going between the shadows. And a little bit on my, I lost a little on my um, brush pile. I'm just adding this here and there. And that helps the brush pile a little bit. And these were leaves that were all, they got a little dark. I'm just dabbing that on there. Yeah, that's helpful. And then down here is my other trunk on the ground. Um, if you have strong shadows from a tree, make sure you have light on the other side. But they don't all need light. Now, I'm not putting light on everything here, uh, especially where my leaves are deeper in color. And the same with your leaves. You can do the same thing. Uh, I got some other colors here. If you lose the light in your leaves, uh, here's some yellows and a light green. This might not be the right green, but, oh, this one might, though. This, uh, this one is sage, pale sage, and then I have an ochre yellow ochre and a cream. Oops, oops. And then I have this apple green color. What is this? I forget. Chartreuse. Yeah. And these are Prismacolor. But if I want to bring some light color back into my leaves, I can do that too with, with a pencil. And that adds some light color back. Or some of this. Now this might be too springy looking, I think. Yeah. But when they start to lose their color, the green leaves get that yellow-green color for a little bit. But you can do that here and there and see if it works. And the same with the yellow. 
this isn't working as well. I don't think that the colors aren't light enough, but you can do it over an orange or a red or to bring some of that light back. But I'm not worried about that. I just wanted to show you about the tree trunks. Now, the last thing you want to do is you want to sign your paintings. So I'm going to grab my trusty um, watercolor, I mean my glass dip pen. You can use a regular pen. Uh, some people think you should always use watercolor. Now, think about if you're making a painting that you're going to frame, leave your edges for your mat and go inside that. So I would probably do it over here because I got the branch down over here, which is a cool effect. So I'll probably do it in the shadow. And what I'm going to do is make a pool of probably just black. I'll do black. Uh, let's see. This black looks pretty good. Mm. Somewhere where I'm not going to I got to make a puddle though because if it's not a puddle then I can't get enough ink on my or ink, enough paint on my brush or my pen. Golly, I can't talk this morning. Yeah, this isn't deep enough. It's easier if you have a well. Um kind of a palette that you're using. This one is not really the correct palette, although I could use my brush there. That'll work too. Just brush it on there and get some, get yourself some watercolor in those holes. And then I'm just going to sign it. Oops, and I just dripped. I was going to say, make sure you take the first drip off the top. There, I got that off. And if you want to put the year on, you can put the year on. Then I just rinse it in water, wipe it off to make sure I've got all the paint out, and that's it. And then you're all set. So I hope you enjoyed this video. Please give it a thumbs up if it was helpful to you in any way. And um, let me know if you've done the painting. Post it on your Instagram account and tag me. I don't get on Facebook much, so if you tag me over there, chances are I'm probably not going to see it. Although lately I've been checking my Facebook a little more because it's something that I can get on with a very poor internet signal. Instagram requires a lot more uh, data usage um, to see anything, probably because of the photos. So um, anyway, that's it everybody. Remember, be courageous, paint with wild abandon, and most of all, be kind to each other. Take care.